tonight. Uh, about a hundred years ago, uh, approximately around a hundred years ago, there was a, a young man who went to a missions conference. He was uh, headed to the mission field. He went to a mission conference, and there at that mission conference, he met a young lady that was very interested in missions, felt called to missions, uh, was trying to figure out God's will for her life, and they got acquainted at that missions conference, and it was one of them deals where it was kind of love at first sight. They just connected. They just had the same interest and, and so forth, and they just really kicked in, and they tried to get to know each other as much as possible during that week of missions conference, tried to learn about their backgrounds, their families, their you know what they were looking for in life and so forth, and man, it just seemed like things were... Uh, really gelling, and uh, he uh, told her, he, you know, he's, he's had to go back to his missionary, he's headed overseas, and uh, he told her he would be in contact with her. And she, being a, a godly young lady, just waited for the letter, and so eventually, a few weeks le- later, a letter came, and in the letter, he uh, eloquently proposed to her for her hand in marriage. She was delighted, she was thrilled, and and he asked for her response to his request. Well, she excitedly sat down at the, a table and, and wrote her reply that she accepted his uh, proposal for marriage. Her brother was there, and he was leaving, and she sealed. He didn't know about the letter. I mean, he, 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 just, he didn't know just all it was. But she sealed it up, addressed it. And handed it to him and said, would you mail this for me as you go to work today? And he agreed that he would. And he put it in his pocket and took it to uh, town with him. And uh, a week went by and another week went by. And two more weeks went by and a month went by. And two months went by and four months went by and six months went by. And she never got a response from him. And she just assumed that. Something had really happened, uh, you know, that he had just totally changed his mind about things, and she just, you know, was, just didn't know what to do, but he never did respond to her. And uh, she was real crushed, and she was hurt, and she was bewildered, and she was, you know, just, well, Lord, I thought that just seemed like that was going to be your will. Anyway, uh, she went on with her life. Several years later, her brother passed away, and she was in charge of taking care of his personal effects. She went into his closet to get his clothes out and to go through them. And in the jacket that he was wearing that day, she found inside the pocket the letter she had written to that missionary young man. It had never been mailed. Not only did she think that he hadn't responded to her, he had thought all those years she had never responded to him. And there's something we can learn from that story in this is that you and I have a letter from God that's been handed to you and I. It's a letter of the love and the imitation of God to sinners. And I just wonder sometimes if it's just not still in our pocket. And I wonder sometimes at Judgment Day, is God going to say, what did you do with the letter I told you to mail? I'd like you to think about that. This week, don't leave the letter in your pocket. Take it and deliver it. You know, a lot of misery and a lot of bitterness, a lot of grief, a lot of sorrow, and a lot of perplexion and confusion could have been saved if that letter had just been delivered. Can you imagine what went through her mind when she picked, pulled that letter out of one of the inside pockets of his coat years later? And I thought about, you know what? We carry, we got the gospel. We've got God's letter. We need to be taking it to people. We need to make sure that when it's handed to us, that we get it where it's supposed to go. That's why my... Laser purpose is to get the gospel to everybody we can, every way we can, every time we can. That's my purpose. And let's, let's make that our purpose as a church. Let's do what that verse said. Let's make that more than just a beautiful uh, mural on the wall. Let's make it a part of who we are. Samuel tonight, 1 Samuel 25, we're preaching through the life of David. I said uh, Samuel 25, I meant 1 Samuel 26, but I bet you're real close if you're at Samuel, 1 Samuel 25, aren't you? Amen. All righty. Uh, we're going to read verses 7 through 12 tonight as a text, and then we'll begin to preach. Verse 7, everybody there say amen. amen. Let's just stand for the reading of God's word before we preach tonight. I want you to be praying for me while I preach. I need the power of God. 
And we're going to read the scripture, a text, and then we're going to pray. Verse number 7, And so David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench. What has happened here, there is a Ziphite uh, situation here where they have, uh, Saul is still chasing David, trying to kill David. And uh, David and Abishai goes down into the camp uh, of Saul. This amazing story said, They came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now, therefore, let me smite him. David, many times, as I told you in Scripture, is a, is a um, type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Abishai and Joab and his brethren are a type of the law. The law always wants to smite you. The law will kill you. Paul talked about that. It, it, the letter killeth, the Bible said. But Christ wants to give us mercy and wants to give us grace. Well, he, he said, uh, he said uh, now therefore let me, pray, let me smite him. I pray thee with a spear even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. He said, now, David, you don't have to worry about it. When I hit him, it'll be over with. I won't miss. And they were right there. Verse number 9, And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. Now these were going to be evidence. They were going to be evidence of the mercy of David that he had on Saul's life. These are evidences of mercy. God gives you and I evidences of mercy. Verse number 12, So David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster, and they got them away, and no man saw it nor knew it, neither awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. The rest of the chapter tells about David. He gets in a distance, and he, begins, he shouts out, and he hollers uh, to Abner, uh, and, and rebukes him for not protecting his master, and so forth. And then again, they has a discussion with Saul, and... Um, and, and it goes on down through the chapter. Saul even talks a good talk. He said, I've played the fool and have erred exceedingly and, uh, and so forth. But if you go back one or two chapters, I believe it's 1 Samuel 24, you'll find this is not the first time that David showed mercy to Saul. There was another time when they were hunting David. They come up into the cave of Adullam there in that area, and David and his men were back in the cave, and Saul went inside the cave, and the Bible said cut to cover his feet to take a nap. And while he was sleeping, uh, again, this same bunch, they wanted to kill him, and David said, no, we're going to show him mercy, and he cut off the part of his skirt and, uh, and showed it to him later on, and he gave him mercy. There's a pattern here showing you that God uh, gives a man mercy. God gives a man a space of mercy, a time for mercy. But then there's also a time when the mercy of God runs out. It's no more. The door of mercy shuts. And I want to preach tonight on the mercy of God. I want to preach on the mercy of God shown in the life of David. Father in heaven, we bow before you this evening. And Lord, uh, so desperately aware of the need of the power and unction and anointing of the Holy Ghost of God. Lord, I have no desire to preach apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that tonight you would fill me afresh and anew, Lord. I mean, Lord, that you would pour your spirit out upon me and help me to preach under the hand of the Holy Spirit tonight. Lord, to such a degree that I would not be seen, but that the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the truths of the Word of God would, Lord, come into view and clearly be seen. I pray, God, tonight that the throne of grace would be seen tonight in the true tabernacle in heaven, in the heavenlies. Lord, that mercy seat that's available tonight, I pray, God, that we'll see beyond the mercy seat And see, Lord, when it is changed into a throne of judgment. And I pray, God, tonight that you'll help us, that our minds and hearts might be cleared, that we would have a new appreciation and a clear understanding of the doctrine of mercy as it pertains to our salvation. And I pray, Lord, tonight for the glory of God to be in this service. And I pray, Lord, tonight even that there would be folks saved in this service and saved that listen to this message wherever it may go out. 
We'll ask in Jesus' name and for his glory, amen. And amen. You may be seated tonight. As I said, David twice showed Saul mercy. David, and I don't know exactly, but I'm going to say this at least probably a hundred times in the book of Psalms, spoke of God's mercy. This week I began to look, and I probably should have counted them, but I didn't, but I began to notice. I counted at least 70 some, even outside that one chapter where mercy is mentioned in every verse, I think it's Psalms 136, where he says in every verse, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. His mercy is new every morning. His mercy is new every morning. And so if you take all the verses of that chapter and put them together with the others, you're going to have somewhere about a hundred times that David talks about this doctrine of the mercy of God. The Bible said in the book of Acts that David was a man after God's own heart. I believe that one of the reasons he was a man after God's own heart was that he understood the doctrine of mercy, probably more so than any man in the Bible. I also believe that David experienced what you and I will experience along our Christian journey, that even when he was saved, when David was first saved, when he, when he trusted the Messiah as his Savior, he probably did not realize the depths and the understanding of the mercy of God until he later sinned with Bathsheba. And you can tell from his psalms writing then that there was a depth of understanding the mercy of God. Oftentimes, as Christians, we don't really see the depths of the mercy of God till we've messed up and we've failed God and, and things got out of kelter. And, and all of a sudden, we begin to realize the true depths of the mercy of God. As I said, David is a type of Christ, and David understood that God is a God of mercy. This story is a picture of God's mercy extended to a lost and guilty sinner. Fifteen to twenty times previously to this, Saul had attempted to cause the murder of David, either personally with a javelin or setting up some type of a scenario. Really, I actually think it's about 19 times, if you count them, that Saul made a scripture in the Bible records, made an effort to see the death of David. And yet David continuously shows him mercy. There are two areas of mercy in the Bible. One area of mercy or or two aspects of mercy in the Bible. One aspect of mercy is the mercy of God toward man. The other aspect of mercy is from one man to another man. God teaches us his mercy toward us and then wants us to translate that into mercy toward others around us. The Bible said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. God wants us to be like him in this area. But tonight I'm dealing with only one aspect of mercy in the Bible, and that aspect is the aspect of God's mercy toward you and I. There are two cases in the New Testament, specifically among many others, where men cried out to God for mercy. I'll discuss them a little later as we move through the message. But mercy tonight is defined as not getting what we justly deserved. Not getting what we justly deserved. Grace is getting what we did not deserve, but mercy is not getting what we did deserve. In Psalms 103, which is one of my favorite Psalms, he said, the Bible said, He hath not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. And he said, He pitieth us as a father pitieth the children. And the whole chapter is, is encased in the idea of God's mercy toward us in that if he had done justly toward you and I, we would be in hell. But God had mercy upon us. Grace, again, is getting what you didn't deserve, the favor and kindness of God. But mercy is getting what you did not deserve. That's the forgiveness of God. Mercy is predicated. Mercy is actually a legal term or a judicial term. Mercy is predicated on the truth that God is a holy God. It is predicated on the truth that God is righteous, that God is a just and holy God, and that God being a good and just and holy God must punish sinners. He must punish crimes or he would not be a holy judge. It is predicated on the guiltiness of man. Where If man is not guilty, there is no need of God's mercy. It is predicated upon that truth. It is also predicated upon the fact that man has no ability, no capacity to save himself or to pay for his sins within himself. Mercy is predicated upon these biblical truths that God is holy, he is just, he is righteous, and that he must, as a righteous judge, punish sin. And it is predicated upon the fact that man is guilty, or there would be no need of ever mentioning the mercy of God, 
and the fact that man is unable to pay his sin debt or to satisfy in any way the just demands of a holy God. The modern gospel, and I want to, I want to zero in on this tonight. The modern gospel, see, I am troubled and have been troubled nearly since I started preaching. I'll probably die still troubled. But I want to tell you something, there's something bothers me. There's something wrong with the gospel that's being preached in this country. And I want to tell you why. It is not producing dedicated, faithful, committed, devoted Christian people. Committed to Christ above everything else in their life. The gospel that's being preached in America is something we carry along. It's a handy insurance policy. It's a fire insurance policy. While we go live our life and God be damned, I'm going to do what I want to do. There's something wrong with a gospel that does not transform people into appreciative, thankful, grateful, humble people for the mercy of God. Yet Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 says that not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he has saved us. The Bible teaches clearly that a man cannot be saved apart from the mercy of God. Of God. He has to receive and acknowledge and receive the mercy of God in order to be saved. Mercy is not a New Testament doctrine only. You find it from the, when Adam and Eve sinned right on down through the Old Testament that God extended mercy by the sacrifice of an innocent substitute to save the guilty. Lot received mercy, the Bible says. Abraham, the Bible, all these, you can go to your Bible and check these out. The Bible clearly teaches that these men received mercy. Abraham received mercy. Joseph received mercy. Jacob received mercy. Israel received mercy. David received mercy. And all of the men in the Old Testament lived and were saved by the mercy of Almighty God. The prophets Isaiah, Hosea, Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk, They all spoke of the need for the mercy of Almighty God. One of the great testimonies of the prophets was not just judgment, but that they could avert judgment if they would avail themselves of the mercy of a holy God. God desires tonight to deal with men in mercy and not in justice. God God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but had he come to repentance and faith in Christ. Mercy, by its very definition in nature, says several things. Mercy says by its definition in nature, first of all, I am a guilty transgressor, a sinner. I am guilty before God of violating his holy laws. I am a transgressor. I am a sinner. If that's not the case, there is no need for mercy. Second of all, if God is just and holy, I should be punished. A person who is going to be a recipient recipient of mercy, which is required to be saved, has to come to a place of understanding that they should be punished for their sin. An understanding of mercy also says that I have no merit within myself. I have no worthiness. I have no value. I have no means of saving myself apart from the righteousness of mercy of God. The mercy also indicates and is defined in the sense that I have no righteousness, that God would be just, God would be just in sending me to hell. God would be doing right to send me to hell. I want to ask you tonight, have you ever come to that understanding? Have you ever come to that place? That if God did justly, he would send you and I to hell. That if God did right, he'd send every one of us to hell. It also says that God would be righteous in casting me into everlasting darkness. That God would be just in sentencing me to the lake of fire. That God, to be a holy and just God, would have to punish me because I'm a transgressor and a sinner. It also, it also indicates that I am unworthy of the least of God's mercy. That there's nothing in me that deserves the mercy or the grace of God. It also say, it indicates that I'm a wicked, that I'm a sinner, that I'm lost, I'm unholy, and that I'm justly condemned. The problem is nobody seems to think they're that bad anymore. You see, as I've preached over the years, I could count on my hands one or two times when I've actually heard people come to the place of where they cried out to God for mercy. There is something wrong with our salvation message. When you have, when the last time or ever have you heard anybody in the process of, quote, getting saved, cry out to God for mercy? And yet the only prayer I know about in the Bible where it says to be saved, about being saved, where a man said, 
God be merciful to me, a sinner. If you want a sinner's prayer, I will tell you this, that you don't even hear that in the repetition prayer that people lead people in prayer. You don't even hear them talking about mercy when they're saying, follow me in prayer. Mercy has been taken out of, it has been dissected and taken out of the gospel message. Because mercy predicates also something else, repentance. The Bible said the fear of the Lord, by the fear of the Lord, men uh, depart from evil or from wickedness. That departing from evil, that departing from wickedness is another term for repentance. And they do it by the fear of the Lord. Let me tell you, I said this morning, people are getting to where they don't want preaching. They don't want any kind of hellfire, damnation preaching. They don't want to hear about judgment. They don't want to hear about sin. It's all psycho babble. Psycho babble, psycho babble, psycho babble, all about it's Jesus, 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 and oh, we, we, we had a great time at worship today. Never talk about sin, never talk about repentance, never talk about the need for mercy. Everybody's just joined the club. Everybody has signed up. Everybody's part of the social establishment of religion. Nobody thinks they're that bad. And I'm saying to you this, that I, we need to ask ourselves, have we ever cried out to God for mercy? Have we ever said to God ourselves, Lord, I'm not dependent upon a prayer. I'm not dependent upon uh, tears. I'm not dependent upon good works. I'm not dependent on anything, Lord, except your mercy. And God, by your mercy, would you save me tonight? God, I am a guilty sinner. I want to ask you an honest question tonight. Have you, did your salvation experience involve getting the mercy of God, asking for the mercy of God? Did it involve that? We've replaced salvation with a let's make a deal, God. This is why there's so little dedication to God, to the church, to his work. This is why there's so little devotion. You see, people that never did see their need for mercy see no need to serve him. They see no, there's no, there's no motivation for not, a man who understands that he has had mercy, that he should have been in hell, will have a desire to repay that debt of love as much as he can. Paul said, I, he said, I have a, he said, I'm debtor to all men. What was it he's talking about? He said, I should have been in hell. He said, but I obtained mercy. And he said, I have a debt of love. And that motivated Paul, the fact that God would have mercy upon him. There's something about the fact when the mercy of God flows through your soul and you realize but a heartbeat you could have been in hell forever, but the mercy of God reached down and saved your soul. There's something that causes you that we love him because he first loved us. And it motivates, and this is what troubles me. I am not seeing the dedication. I am not seeing the consecration. I am not seeing the commitment. I am not seeing the surrender. I am not seeing the unashamedness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question. I'm doing uh, these Facebook little clips, five different tips. And I mentioned this morning about some of you getting on there and giving your testimony. I want to ask you a question tonight. Is it going to bother you to get on Facebook and tell about how you were a sinner and was headed to hell and Jesus Christ died for you and how he had mercy on you and saved you? Is that going to bother you for everybody else in the country to see that? You know why you may not be able to do that? Because you don't know what mercy is. You've really never had mercy. It's a religious fix you've got, but not salvation. There's something wrong with us when we are ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And don't tell me you're bashful or it's not your nature. Any drowning man is glad for a hand to reach up for him. He gets over his bashfulness real quick. Well, I don't shake hands. Any man in a fire will run out of that fire. You see, it has to do with an understanding that you should have been in hell, but God had mercy upon your sin. You say, Reggie, I just, I, it just seemed like I, I, I'm saying this. This is why there's so little love to God. This is why there's no commitment to the cause of Christ and faithfulness to the faith. Mercy is foundational to salvation. Now, the tabernacle, which is a picture of how God redeems mankind and how we and I can have access to cross, teaches us, one of the first things it teaches us is the mercy of God. In fact, the Bible teaches that the tabernacle had what's called a mercy seat. A mercy seat. And the mercy seat was a lid that was placed on top of the Ark of the Covenant. That tabernacle, that mercy seat was made out of pure gold. The ark, which speaks of Jesus Christ, was wood and gold. The wood spoke of his humanity. The gold spoke of his deity. He was the God-man, the incarnate son of God. But the mercy seat was all gold. 
That tells you and I that salvation is all of God, it is all of mercy, it's all of grace, and that man has no part in it, and it is exclusively and completely and purely the grace and the mercy of God that saves us. But that mercy seat had to have something. It had to have the sprinkling of blood on the mercy seat. The mercy seat could not extend mercy until blood had been applied to it. They would take the innocent lamb or the bullock or whatever, and they would come in there and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, and then you could approach God. If you tried, watch this, if you tried to enter into the mercy seat without the sprinkling of blood, you would be killed by God Almighty. You could not come into his presence unless you had the blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. Now listen to me well. This gets back to the doctrine of the exclusivity of Jesus Christ and his his shed blood for our sin. There is no way to God, if you try to come to God without coming by his mercy through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you will not get to God. You cannot get to God except through the shed blood which provides the mercy of God. If you tried to enter any other way, it was death. It speaks of the substitution and the sacrifice, Jesus Christ, the innocent, the sinless, the guiltless, dying for you and I, the guilty, the death of the innocent in place of the guilty. I want to just insert this now. The mercy seat, it's a a mercy seat now, tonight, today, it is a mercy seat. One day, that will cease to be the mercy seat and it will become a throne of judgment. The door of mercy is open now, but there will come a time when that that mercy seat will be available to no man in eternity. But it is available tonight. The mercy seat was also above the law. It was on top. It was a lid. That means that mercy is above law. The law, (coughs) the tablets, was kept inside the ark. Also, mercy forgives and it saves, but the law condemned. But mercy has more power through the shed blood of Jesus Christ than the condemnation of the law. Think about this. Abishai said, let me smite him. That's law. But mercy said, "Uh uh-uh. Let's extend mercy. David. The mercy seat lived for the Ark of the Covenant. As I said uh, it, it was it, the law kept in there. It also had the manna inside the Ark of the Covenant, which speaks of Christ. Now, the law speaks of, uh, in there spoke of Christ keeping the law, that he's the sinless substitute. The manna, pot of manna spoke of he's our life, our sustenance. But it also had the rod that budded, which speaks of his resurrection. And all of that speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mercy from God is only found on the basis of Jesus Christ. Now, watch this. That ark is a picture of Christ and his redemptive work. The lid was on top of that. That was the basis for mercy was Jesus Christ. You can find mercy nowhere in the world except through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you one more before we leave the mercy seat. The mercy seat had two cherubims. Cherubims facing each other, their wings spread out like this, facing each other on that deal. When you first heard about the cherubims in the Bible, they had a flaming sword in their hand. But at the mercy seat, the sword was gone. You know why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ took the sword out of the cherubim's hand. And now instead of death, you can find life. Instead of, instead of being against you, now they protect you in the Lord Jesus Christ. God changed all that around. We can now approach God through the mercy of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to get this tonight, that mercy is never arbitrarily just given. God just doesn't say, you know what, I just kind of like Reg. You know, he's tried to do his best a little bit once in a while. I'm just going to be merciful to him. God does not just arbitrarily give mercy. Mercy can only be given. God is just. He cannot pass over sin. He has to punish sin. Mercy is only extended through justice. Only extended through justice. Justice had to be satisfied before mercy could be extended. Somebody had to pay for our sin in order for you and I to have mercy. If somebody did not pay for our sin, then you and I are still held accountable for it. Either you pay for your sin by eternal separation from God, or Jesus Christ pays for your sin through the blood of the cross by his sacrifice. But the truth is, you and I will never ever pay for our sin. That's why hell is forever. 
You can burn and scream and wail and weep and gnash your teeth forever in hell, and people do, and are tonight. But they will never pay for their sin. Again, mercy is only extended and can only be extended through the blood of Jesus Christ. Only on the merits of Christ's atoning work. Atoning work. Mercy is never given at the expense of God's holiness. Mercy is never given at the expense of God's righteousness or his justice. In the New Testament, when you come into the New Testament, there's a word you find three times in the Bible. Three is the number of divine. It's the word, listen to it, propitiation. It's a long word, but it's a wonderful, beautiful, beautiful word. And propitiation is given in Romans 3.25 where it says that we're propitiated through, the, through faith in Jesus' blood. In 1 John 2.2, 2, the Bible said Christ is the propitiation for our sins. In 1 John 4.10, the Bible said here in his love that God sent his son, only son to be the propitiation for our sins. All right, what is propitiation? It's, propitiation is the fact that holy God... Just, righteous God has, has had the law, the demands of the law satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ. That's why it means Jesus perpetuated for us, that we, God is perpetuated. He is satisfied with the blood of Jesus Christ. Here it is. When that blood was sprinkled on that mercy seat, death had occurred. Somebody had died for sins. God said, I'm satisfied. Now listen to me tonight. This will give you assurance and blessing. If you have received Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you have received his mercy, your sin debt is satisfied and God is propitiated and God is, God is absolutely forever, no charge, it's all paid for, he's propitiated, his just demands are satisfied in the death of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's paid for, amen. God is propitiated. That's why you want to learn to love that word. That God, a holy God, a just God, is satisfied with, with the work of Jesus Christ with his shed blood. It's the just demands of a holy God for the payment and punishment of sins. And it has and is and forever will be satisfied in the sacrificial substitutionary shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. The law demanded death and Christ died. And the law has been satisfied in Jesus Christ. And those now who come through faith can be perpetuated before Almighty God. Psalms 85.10 says this, the, the, concerning the prophecy of the cross, mercy and truth are met together. And that's what happened at the cross of Calvary. The truth of our sin, the truth of God's holiness, met the, met the, uh, the justice, met the, met the mercy of Almighty God. In the New Testament, who was it that asked for mercy? When you come in the New Testament, the Gospels, you listen to the life of Jesus Christ. You find out that it was the blind, the halt, those who had lost loved ones in death, the lepers, the afflicted, the humble, the poor, were constantly, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. You read it through the Gospels. It's over and over again to Jesus Christ, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. But you never one time hear... The proud Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and lawyers ever asking Jesus for mercy about nothing. Now, this scares me. It reminds me of nowadays. It reminds me of our generation. The only thing those Pharisees had was a self-righteous contempt for those who did want mercy. And I want to tell you, I'm going to preach a message on contempt. And I have learned through years in the ministry that contempt is one of the most vicious tools of Satan to destroy that I know of. Jesus told those people, he said, you've neglected the more weightier law, matters of the law, justice and mercy. He said, you're all about washing your hands Wearing the right clothes, having the right kind of haircut, doing all the right stuff. He said, "You don't, you don't even care about the true weightier matters of the law. What really counts?" He said, "You're all the time washing pots and pans and trying to prove to everybody externally that you're that you're holy, that you're righteous." Oh man! Oh, you're quoting verses. You're trying to prove to everybody how spiritual I am. He said, let me tell you what's a lot more important than your externals is God's mercy in your life. 
Let me tell you something. Mercy will do. It'll take the cockiness out of us. It'll take the contemptuousness out of us. It will make us an humble people. It'll make us an enthused people. It'll make us a joyful people. I'm telling you, people that have experienced mercy have the joy of the Lord in their hearts. I'm telling you something. They're happy they ain't going to hell. Amen. Amen. I'm happy I ain't going to hell. Are you happy you ain't going to hell? No, because I don't need mercy. I'm good enough. I'm telling you something. It's going to bite you. You better. You better I'm saying, listen, you better watch this thing. Now, there's two men in the, in the New Testament, I said specifically, that asked for mercy. The first one is a man who went down to the temple with the other man. And the first man comes in and says, Lord, I tithe of all I have, and I do this, and I fast, and I do all this stuff. And the second man, the Bible said, wouldn't even lift up his head, but bowed his head and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, listen to what the Bible said that that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. I said this morning that whether all these statistics I read all the time are right or not, that 80% of young people, now listen to me, coming out of Bible-believing, quote, churches aren't churched when they're 25 years and past. I believe this is the reason. It's all been Phariseeism. There's been no mercy. They've never been made to understand. They just think they're good little Christian kids and they're sick of it. And I want to tell you kids something in this church house. You're never going to have a pastor that loves you anymore. You may think I'm a rough old codger. You may not like me. I want you to like me, but I don't want, I don't want your like so much that I don't tell you the truth. You better be careful being raised in a Christian home and being raised in a church like this. You better make sure that it's not all external because you know it all. You better make sure that you have personally really come to God as a guilty sinner and you understand what it means to get mercy from God. I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm just being honest with you. I've seen too much. I've seen too much. Growing up in a church like this, no appreciation for the gospel. No appreciation. I mean, just act like... No happiness. The only thing that makes you happy is happy drilling, drilling a basketball or getting a truck or a car or whatever. You're not happy about the Lord. You have no enthusiasm about the work of God, the things of God. You haven't even thought about witnessing to anybody. You're so scared of everybody. You're so scared of people. You wouldn't, you wouldn't mention it to anybody. I am telling you there's something wrong with that kind of Christianity. I've said this over and over again. That's exactly what I was. And I knew it down in my heart of hearts. I knew I did not have the genuine article. There was no fruit in my life. I would sit in church. I knew all the stuff to do. I would taught Sunday school. I would led singing. I had done all the stuff. You can ask Van. But I'm telling you something. There's a difference whenever you come before the fear of Almighty God and you realize that he could justly in a second send you to hell forever and be just in doing it and have done right sending you to hell. And it's only his mercy that you're not there tonight. There's something happens to you on the inside. That man said, be merciful to me, a sinner. There was another man in the, that's recorded in the Bible as saying that he wanted God's mercy, and that's the rich man in Luke chapter 16. And I want to tell you something. The night that man looked up, the Bible said, and said, have mercy upon me. He's in hell. And he said, God, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus. That, what's this? That he may, you think about this tonight, that you may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm in torment in these flames. That man wanted mercy there, but here's the situation. One of them received mercy, the other did not, because one of them had turned away mercy in his life. There's a time when the door of mercy shuts. And he was denied, because he delayed to take God's mercy, he was denied God's mercy. And I'm going to tell you something. If you die without God's mercy, you'll be in hell. And there is no mercy in hell tonight. There is nobody to dip their finger in a tip of water and go down to hell and put it on the tip of your tongue and try to relieve your parched tongue tonight. There's nobody gives a rip about your quailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell. There is no mercy in hell. Nobody's going to walk up to you and put their arm around you and say, Oh, I feel sorry for you in hell. There is no mercy in hell. Mercy is now. And if you don't take God's mercy now, there'll be no mercy for all of eternity. It's interesting to me that in the book of Revelation, mercy, merciful mercies is never mentioned one single time in the book of Revelation. You know what that's telling you? That when that, I'm going to tell you something, when that door shuts, it's over with and there's a time when God's mercy is no more. Saul was extended mercy, but he never received it. And all he, what he did that day in your text, he sealed his doom and his damn. 
by rejecting the mercy of God. I want to ask you tonight, have you been saved through the mercy of God, really? Honestly? You want to know why tonight that some of you listening to me, your Christian experience is so fake and so phony, so dead, so dull, so dry, so shallow, is because in all all honest to goodness, you're not saved. Because I want to tell you something that happens to saved people. They have a love for God, even though they fail. They have some enthusiasm for God. They want to serve God. They want to give of their life to God. I'm just telling you tonight. These are things that accompany salvation. Read your Bible. If you plant corn, you don't expect to get green beans. What you plant is what you get. And I'm just telling you something tonight that really bothers me. Is this Christianity that has no enthusiasm, no fire, no zeal, no joy. I mean, it don't matter if I miss a service. It don't matter if I, you know, it don't ma- it, it's no big deal to me. I just don't get it. That's what you can attribute to the lack of commitment, the lack of devotion, the lack of dedication, the lack of love for God, for the brethren and for sinners. Let me tell you another thing that happens to you when you've got mercy. You start caring for people's souls. You know what I, I'm telling you something. I have to, listen, we have to stir up. But it's just ought to become natural for people to want to care about somebody else's soul if they've ever experienced mercy themselves. Paul said, I obtained mercy. Honestly, tonight, let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked God for his mercy? Are you saved by his mercy or are you saved by some kind of intellectual agreement, intellectual exercise? We do not deserve a merit the forgiveness of our sins. We do not deserve or merit a home in heaven. We do not deserve the kindness and goodness of God. We do not deserve salvation. It is according to his mercy that he saved us. It's all mercy. And I want to say tonight that we need to get away with all of our self-righteousness. True conversion involves God's mercy on our hell-deserving souls. Those who understand and have experienced mercy, again, I want to say there'll be a There'll be a a numbleness about them before the Lord. There'll be a thankfulness. They're thankful that they've been saved. They realize where they could have been. And I want to say again, there'll be some joy. There'll be some enthusiasm. You know what's funny to me? You can go to a ball game and shout, and you're a fan. But you come to church and shout, you're a fanatic. Isn't that strange? I went to a couple of ball games this week. I enjoyed them. I enjoyed them. But I got sitting there, sitting there thinking. And I get the same way. I mean, boy, I, well, I want to get you. Know, I want to tell you something. The fact that we don't have the enthusiasm for God's work and worshiping the Lord, it tells something about us. Mercy acknowledges from the depths of a man's heart that salvation is of the Lord, that all the glory belongs to God. That all the praise belongs to God. That all, the, all it's all of grace and mercy. And I'm just telling you the truth tonight. If you and I had got what we deserve, we'd already be in hell. And I guess, Brother Phil, that's what keeps me going. Is that what God loved me so much, he extended his mercy to me through Jesus Christ. I owe him a debt of love. And I think I'm going to be happy forever about it. I don't think there's ever going to be a time when I'm not happy that I got saved, that I'm not in hell. Amen? The, not tonight, the door of mercy is open. Let me give you an illustration about mercy. And we'll close out. I think I've told this story before. There was a well thought of kind of a, uh, you know, big shot in the community rancher one time that got charged with prosecution for stealing cattle. And his, boy, and I mean, he just got all huffy and puffy and hired him a big shot lawyer. And boy, the, you know, he told that prosecutor and that neighbor that accused him of stealing cattle. He said, I want to tell you something. He said, when I get done with this thing, I'm counter suing you. And said, you ain't seen the other. Well, I mean, he made a big deal about it. And every walk down, and all the cafes and the talk and stuff, boy, and I mean, he just, you know, that, 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 they would, they, that they had the audacity to charge him with stealing those cattle. Court date come, and they got the jury all set. Judge is in there getting ready to start up, and prosecuting attorney went up to the judge's bench. He said, I'd like you to call the other attorney, the defense attorney, and his client, uh, the plaintiff up here. And they called him up there, and he said, I'd like to have a meeting in the side room with all of us. Judge, or not the judge, he said, I'd like to have a meeting in here. 
So they go into the side room there, and they've got a little TV set and a VCR. They're standing there, and they kick it on. And what it, what it shows is a video of that man's cattle trailer backed up to the little place there. And shows him looking and looking and looking, him and another guy, and they're stealing these cattle. And that guy just about melts down. And he looks at his attorney and says, oh, my God, what are we going to do? He says, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Number one, you quit your lying and acting like you're something. You're, you're a stinking thief and you've lied to me. Number two, he said, you're going to go out here at this judge. And he said, you are going to ask for mercy because there is no defense. The game is up. And you know what? The guy thought to himself, okay, so he's going to go out there and he, you know, he's going to plead for mercy and thinks he's going to get off. When they walk up to the judge and the lawyer says to the judge, my client wants to uh, forfeit the trial and wants to plead guilty. And the judge says, well, explain yourself. And so they did. And the judge says, and he says, I, when I ask clemency and leniency for my client, since he admitted to the guilt. And the judge said, no. If you had admitted this before we put all this jury together and went to all the expense and had not this thing been recorded, you would have denied to the last testimony in this, this courtroom that you were not guilty. And because you did that, I'm not going to extend mercy to you. I'm sentencing you. You are guilty. Here's the, mess, here's the thing on that. You've got tonight, you've got now to admit to God that you need his mercy. Someday the video camera is going to roll. Someday the video camera is going to roll. The Bible said every hidden thing of the heart is going to be exposed to God. My prayer is tonight that each one of us will make sure that we've availed ourselves of the mercy of God while we can be. Let's stand together. Father in heaven, we pray tonight, Lord, that you would take this message. I pray, God, tonight that you'd each day of our life, learn to appreciate the mercy of God. Forgive us, Lord, for leaving it out, for taking it out, for acting like we don't need it, for having an attitude, Lord, that we didn't have to have it. Forgive us, Lord, of our pride. Forgive us, Lord, of our acting and living as if we hadn't received mercy. Lord, I pray tonight that you'll Work this truth into our hearts and our lives, the fabric of our souls. I want to thank you, Lord, tonight for your mercy toward me. Lord, you could have justly sent me to hell a long time ago. Lord, tonight I could have been burning and screaming in a devil's hell. But you had mercy. And I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you shed your blood in my place for my sin, that you took death upon you in my punishment. I thank you that you sprinkled your blood on the mercy seat and that I could have access and I could receive God's mercy. Oh, God, tonight, take the pride out of our hearts, root and branch. Tear it from us. Dear Lord, tonight, I'm not the judge. But I fear, Heavenly Father, with all my heart that there are those in this building tonight, God, who somehow or another, they went through the motions. They know it all. But there's something missing. It's the realness of Christ in their life. And they've never honestly, Lord, come to you as a guilty sinner, recognizing their unworthiness and the great unimaginable price that was paid to keep them out of hell. And they have no appreciation for the things of God. Oh God, tonight I pray, would you deal in their heart? Lord, would you bring them to yourself? Would you make them see, God, the value of mercy and that without it they have no hope? Dear Lord Jesus, tomorrow morning when I get up, when I wake up, Lord, help me to realize that I'm living that I'm not in hell because of the mercy of God. And Lord, I pray that you'll put a smile on my heart and my face because of that. And that Lord, we'll go forth in the joy of the Lord, which is our strength, with a glad heart and a happy spirit, Lord, that you had mercy upon us. 
Not that we deserved it, Lord. And help us to carry that message to other people and just tell them, Lord, about the mercy that you gave us. Oh, God, put it back in our souls, we pray, this issue of mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.